Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Great Artists Bad Day. And today's great artist is the illustrious Herbert von Karajan and his bad day, and it's a really bad day, was his Saint-Saëns Symphony No. 3, the organ symphony, which I've had occasion to trash on numerous, 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 well, you know, videos and written things and reviews and whatnot, because it really, really bites the biggie. It's horrible, absolutely horrible. And the wonderful thing about it is that it's horrible in numerous ways. So let's discuss the numerous ways in which it's horrible. First of all, as a performance in general, it's just boring. Boring and slow and soggy. Here was the original cover. Woof, there it is. Now, you will note from that cover that there is only the Saint-Saëns Organ Symphony on the disc. This, of course, reminds one of that fabulous story about the, the old Jewish couple in Miami that's leaving the restaurant and the husband turns to the wife and says, how was the dinner? And he says, it was awful. And she sa he says to her, what did you think of yours? And she says, mine was terrible too. And then he says, and such small portions. Well, there you go. It's about a 35 minute long symphony and that's all that's on the disc, but Karyan does try to stretch it out to an unconscionable length. I mean, it's just, it's not Chelabidaki slow. It's not insanely slow. It's just boring slow. And, you know, one of the things that happened with late Karyan, and it really was kind of an issue, is that, is that his control started to slip a little bit. Just a little bit, just enough so that, you know, we would go along sometimes with the endless legato in the adagio, for example, and that creamy blended brass sonority. But no, not exactly. It just sounds like it's kind of coming apart just a little bit, just enough to make you uncomfortable like in the chorale passages in the finale or in the tight rhythmic figures in the scherzo. It's just tired, a little bit tired. Not a great performance, not even a, it's an okay performance at best in terms of interpretation. We're talking only about interpretation because the other problem, the other delightful problem that this has is the engineering, the sonics, which were atrocious. Now, you may recall, back in the day, Karyan was a huge proponent of digital recording technology. I mean, digital recording technology was, was designed around Karyan, basically. It really was, you know, uh, around, around his, you know, Sony, who, who went crazy for it. I mean, they were one of the big promoters of it, of course, and they got all of the Karyan videos, which they spent a fortune on and probably lost a fortune on. That was their big coup. They got Karyan. They got the Berlin Philharmonic. They, they chased after these star performers. Um, and that was a corporate decision from the highest echelons of Sony. And the highest echelons of Sony only understood the stardom. They had no clue about musical quality. And they associated money and, you know, these, these, these mega stars with, with, you know, the best quality music. And, that, that we, you know, we all know that was nonsense. We do. Not that Karyan was not a great artist, he certainly was, but to justify the amount of money, the sheer amount of money that was getting flung at these people in the, in the 70s and 80s and 90s is really kind of astonishing when you look back on it. So anyway, so Karyan was a big proponent of digital recording. So why then did his digital recording sound so terrible? They really did. They sounded bad. And uh, there, were, there were a lot of explanations for it. Part of it was that, you know, first of all, the Deutsche Grammophon engineers never sounded that great. And there's a good argument for that. It really depended, like a lot of things, on where they made the recordings. And the Philharmonia in Berlin was not a great place to make recordings, number one. And number two, um, the, they, they were never known for their sonic excellence. They were, they were decent, and, you know, but they were not an audiophile label by any stretch of the imagination. And number three, Karyon himself controlled, supposedly, the, the mixing of his recordings. 
and he wanted exaggeratedly wide dynamic range, and he and apparently his hearing started to go as he got older, or so the story goes. And so he always boosted the treble, which made them sound extremely glary and screechy in the upper registers. And so, and that's true of those recordings. I mean, they were sort of arguing by reverse because we sound bad and this is how they sound bad. And therefore this must be what he wanted because there's no question he had his own mixing equipment. He had his own studio to make these recordings. And so it was part of his, his control freakish megalomania that he did this to himself. And so as a result of that, many of them, not all, but many of them really did sound lousy. But to make this particular recording, simply the acme of engineering ineptitude, I mean, the paragon of, 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 of digital horridness, well, they decided to record the symphony in Berlin somewhere, and the organ at the Cathedral of Notre Dame. Now, you, you don't need to have a degree in acoustical engineering to know that if you record the organ in one building with a very different acoustic from where you're recording the orchestra at a different time, in a different place, and then you slam the two together, the chances are very, very good that the result is not going to be satisfactory. And whoop, guess what happened? The result was just atrocious. First of all, the, the Notre Dame organ sounded horrible at this point in its, in its life. You know, the, the Notre Dame organ has a whole, it, it's a story unto itself. You know, the things that were done to it, who originally built it, the, the multiple restorations and changes and adjustments and things that happened to it. Uh, unfortunately, it seems to have survived the fire. It would have been wonderful if the fire had destroyed that organ and they had to start over with something that sounded good. That organ sounds like a 747 get revving up for takeoff. It really does. I mean, it doesn't even generate audible notes. It generates white noise. It's, it's just an awful, awful sounding instrument. And, and that's, forget about the fact that you've got, you know, what they're doing to it to blend it in with the Berlin Philharmonic. Because remember, this isn't in the organ symphony. This is not a question of, you know, orchestra, then organ, then orchestra, then organ. It's a question of the organ and the orchestra playing simultaneously in tempo. So, of course, Pierre Cochereau or whoever the organist was, you know, he had to have like his headphones and a click track, and you know, to synchronize everything must have been a real ordeal. But in any case, that organ sounded awful. So combine that with an early digital, Carrion mixed, blended acoustic, boring performance of the Sassol Third Symphony, and what do you think came out? Now, now, Deutsche Grammophon, to their credit, was aware of just how bad these things sounded. They really, really were. And so after Carrion was gone and he couldn't say anything about it, they remastered everything as the Carrion Gold Edition. And here it is. There it is, the Carrion Gold Edition, saint saint -Third, which I was very eager to listen to because I was curious to see if they were able to do anything to make this thing tolerable. And they did fix a lot of the recordings. I mean, they did make them better, or at least, you know, better, better, you know, more, more pleasant and less lacerating to listen to. They managed to do some things. And so this thing shows up with its original image bit processing or whatever it's called. And I thought to myself, oh, this will be interesting. So I put it on and it was very interesting to compare the two because the orchestra definitely sounded a little better. Performance wasn't any better, but the orchestra sounded a little better. But the organ, there was nothing you could do about that organ. Now it sounded, instead of like a 747 revving up for takeoff, it sounded like radio static. I mean, you know, when it comes into the finale, it's just <laughs> like that. I mean, it really, it really, it was just hopeless. There was, there was nothing to be done for it. What they should have done, to be honest with you, is redo the organ part entirely. 
with somebody else because it's not like it's not like the organ part allows the organist to interpret anything i mean he's just counting and keeping up with what the orchestra is doing for the most part and you know find a good organ find a better acoustic and redo the whole organ part then attach it to the performance and who knows maybe the whole combination would come out better than it was but as it is it just blows you know, it's like what they say, life is like a fan. It sucks and blows at the same time. Well, this is absolutely the performance that proves the truth of that little epigram. Because this Saint-Saint third is the pits. The pits. And it's just dazzling to see how many ways it was possible to screw it up. It was really, really quite, kind of sort of a, 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 a legend in the annals of classical music, you know, record catastrophes. You know, there's that show on cable, Engineering Catastrophes. This really ought to be on a new show called Recording Catastrophes. It really was one, but the interpretation wasn't anything special anyway. And so we can safely ignore it. We have a great artist who had a really bad day. In this case, everybody had a bad day. It was uh, an apocalypse, a musical apocalypse. So keep on listening, folks, to other things. Take care.